Informal workers do not receive the protection of law. In fact, informal work is often defined as work that is in law or in practice, insufficiently supported by formal arrangements, such as an employment contract, paid holidays, or social security entitlements under law. Homework in the garment sector falls in this category and takes place without formal arrangements. Home workers carry out from their homes tasks that are essential to the production of garments. Some of these workers perform tasks such as sewing, embroidery, and the finishing of garments for global brands. Others receive cloth or textiles from their employers and return finished garments to them. A significant proportion of them are paid according to the number of garments that they complete work on. They are said to work according to a piece rate. Another large portion of them are own account workers. This means that they invest in the cloth and textiles, make the garments, and then try to sell it themselves or with the help of a family member. Other than garments, homework also contributes to the manufacture of jewelry, electronics, and many other types of consumer goods. Some workers provide services such as repairing shoes and providing childcare in their homes. As we learned in the context of the garment industry, the working conditions in homework are often unfair. Workers, a large proportion of whom are women, are paid on a piece rate and not regular wages. They have no security of employment. Depending on the business cycle, they may work very long hours or not earn any income at all. Most of the time, they have to purchase their own tools. They work in cramped living situations, often without enough light. In nearly all these cases, it is difficult to establish a contract of employment or any formal relationship of employment with a single identifiable employer. Most of the Indian laws that we learnt in the previous module of the course do not apply to home workers. They don't benefit from minimum levels of protection in relation to their wages, their social security or their health and safety. Actually, we talk about two types of home-based workers. Uh, one is home-based workers who work on a piece rate. So, uh, like the first case that I told you, where they came to us, and these are workers that there are shops in that same area. They give little pieces of cloth to the workers. Uh, the women make it into quilt covers, and then they give it back to the shop owner. Or sometimes there's a contractor and they get paid by the piece rate, and the piece rates are very low. Similarly, you will find today uh, a lot of stitching work, right? also at that time, but only kind of stitching, stitching of petticoats, stitching of little children's garments. Uh, you'll find from factories, they give out work like uh, cutting, of, cutting the threads of a piece of cloth, uh, main stitching, so all those types of things uh, are piece rate. That's all they get. They don't invest in anything, although, of course, they have to invest in their own machines, uh, invest in their own homes, invest in their own lighting, and so on. And then there are those who are sort of self-employed. So they would make up a garment and uh, either sell it themselves, or they would um, sell, give it to somebody, uh, sell it to somebody who goes and sells it. So they then have to invest in the cloth and so on. And another type of self-employed is uh, like tailors. The women become tailors. So people would come to the house, give them an order. Uh, so there are of uh, home-based workers who are either you can identify a contractor or employer, or you can't, and then they're kind of self-employed. So those are the two types that exist. In developing countries, it is mainly industrial outwork. But if you look in developed countries, homework also includes teleworkers and this new category that's emerged of uh, digital platform workers. There's some crowd workers who work from their home. But in developing countries, the home workers are primarily in the manufacturing industrial, very industrial outworkers, not completely. And um, we also know that um, I can send you figures because we're just producing a global 
uh, statistical brief with the ILO on home-based work, but it shows both homework and and it's it's South Asia and Southeast Asia are sort of overrepresented. There's a lot of home-based work in those two regions, much more than in other regions of the world. And in part because of the industrial outwork, there's much more manufacturing home-based work in those regions. Uh, and so if you're an industrial outwork or home worker in developing countries in manufacturing, you're subcontracted and you're typically paid by the piece for what you, what you produce. And what we now know as sort of a stylized fact is that home workers are typically paid around half of what the factory workers in that same uh, sector would be. So like, you know, the export garment sector, the ready-made garment sector, the home workers would be paid roughly, they would earn roughly half of what the factory workers. And their <clears throat> problem is that they're dependent on the factories or firms up the chain for the work orders. And the work orders come when there's peak production and the factories and firms want to outsource work. Um, but it can dry up. Um, so in the factories, you have core workers and peripheral workers and the peripheral workers work, but the home workers are losing jobs and orders um, faster than the factory workers. Um, but there's some industries, if you take India, like the beauty industry or the um, uh, incense stick rolling industry, where those are no longer much in factories and it's mainly home-based work. So the work is um, reasonably steady, but the earnings are very low. And because they're invisible in the homes, <laughs> they haven't <clears throat> been, you know, sometimes the wages or the piece rates haven't been increased for decades, right? Because they don't have the bargaining power to, um, to demand it. Um, uh, we found out through COVID, the COVID uh, study that um, in Tirupur, which is the t-shirt capital of India, um, in Tamil Nadu more broadly, uh, the home workers are not registered in the state uh, labor welfare boards to get certain benefits. And this is something that the union of home workers in Tirupur is fighting for because they often don't get recognized as workers. So there, there are layers of problems, right? So they didn't qualify in Tirupur for certain things that uh, other informal workers qualified for as COVID relief. Once the employers said that these are just housewives doing something in their leisure time, that meant that they didn't need to pay them because they were, it was just a quote unquote hobby. And that attitude persists even today. So once they're not workers, you don't need to think about them for uh, any kind of minimum wage. So it immediately contributes to very, very, very low piece rates, even today, very low piece rates. The second thing is um, that none of the social security measures was reaching out to them because they didn't exist. Uh, health and safety is a very important point because when home is the workplace, then unless you uh, invest in the home, you're not investing in the workplace. So um, it, it, more than health and you know, more than safety, because there wasn't many issues of safety, there are few safety issues which were to do with uh, unsafe trades in the home, like fireworks. There were fireworks and matches both happening in the home. Uh, and even today, uh, we do have like lack uh, people who use fire in the home, like lack makers and so on. Uh, but um, <clears throat> on the whole, especially for the garments and so on, safety was not the major concern. A major concern was that the houses that they lived in were small, hot, and very poor lighting, which means it affected their eyes. Uh, tremendously and their productivity went down. So a very low productivity cause of a poor workplace. Oh, I must say one more thing, which is uh, I, I said safety was not a concern. It was a concern because there were children. So there were often small children around. And um, uh, uh, a lot of our members were beady workers 
who made, you know, those homemade cigarettes. And for them, uh, you, they have tobacco in the home. Um, people who are running machines, the children come and put their fingers in at any point. So that was a concern. In fact, <laughs> you ask a home-based worker, what is the best thing about home, working at home? She'll say that uh, we can keep an eye on the children. And then what you ask, what's the most difficult thing? She says, because children are around all the time, so you can't really have a good productivity. You're learning from the third module of this course on decent work for women. In the last video, we learned to look at the gaps in the law and in their implementation to understand what hindered them from benefiting informal sector workers. It is in this context that we need to look at the ILO Convention on Homework of 1996, known as Convention 177. Even though other more generally applicable ILO standards apply to homework as well, home workers face special challenges that other types of workers do not face. That is why there is a separate convention for home workers. The convention's definition of homework is important. Firstly, this is an activity done by a person known as a home worker in their home or in the premises of the home worker's choice. Significantly, the work is not done in premises that are chosen by the employer. Secondly, the work is done for payment. Finally, the work results in a product or service as specified by the employer, irrespective of who provides the equipment, materials or other inputs used. This part of the definition excludes own account workers, even if they work from their homes. Workers who produce goods or provide services without taking instructions from anyone else are not protected by this convention. Let's now look at the definition of employer. Employer means any person, natural or legal, who either directly or through an intermediary gives out homework in pursuance of his or her business activity. The definition protects the very large number of home workers who are provided work by agents who, for example, bring the raw materials and subsequently collect finished goods and make payments. Under Convention 177, ratifying states are obliged to formulate, adopt and implement a national policy on homework aimed at improving the condition of home workers in a consultative manner. This requires states to provide opportunities to unions and associations of workers to raise issues with governments and employers on the implementation of the convention and related issues. The most important set of obligations under the convention relates to the objective of such a national policy. It has to promote the equality of treatment between home workers and other workers, particularly in relation to their right to establish or join organizations of their choice and participate in their activities, that is collective bargaining rights, protection against discrimination in employment and occupation, protection in the field of occupational safety and health, their remuneration, their statutory social security protection, their access to training, their minimum age for admission to employment or work, and maternity protection. The policy shall be implemented through laws, regulations, collective agreements, arbitration awards, or other national practices. In the last module, we learnt about India's labour law and the rights of workers in relation to the employment relationship. We learnt about their rights in relation to collective bargaining, wages, conditions of work including safety and health, and their rights against exploitative practices. We know, however, that most of these rights are not available to home workers. If India were to ratify Convention 177, it would be obliged to pursue a policy under which home workers would receive the same rights. The convention also obliges states to ensure that their labor statistics include homework. The convention also mandates a system of inspection and regular reporting. States have to set up and effectively apply adequate remedies, including penalties in case of violations. As we have learned, patriarchal social norms require women to bear a disproportionate burden of care work in their home and restrict their mobility outside their homes. Businesses have benefited from this vulnerability to source labour cheaply from women working in their homes. Without formal work arrangements, they have avoided paying for their workers' social security, holidays, health and safety standards and their training. Since it was adopted in 1996, however, 
Only 10 countries have ratified Convention 177. India is not one of them. So while the obligations set out under the Convention are not binding on the government of India, the Convention is a strong tool that can help home workers organize and demand better conditions of work. Along with the ILO Social Protection Flows Recommendation of 2012, known as Convention 202, the Homework Convention can broadly be considered a pillar of the international strategy to improve the conditions of work in the informal sector. Recommendation 202 provides guidance to member states in providing to all members of society a basic level of social security throughout their lives. It helps states prioritize the establishment of national floors of social protection accessible to all in need, including workers in the informal economy and their families. This strategy recognizes that informal work is a substantial and rapidly growing part of the world economy and that the state needs to intervene to improve the conditions in that part of the economy. This is important because more than half of the world's workforce is estimated to be part of the informal economy, with that figure rising to more than 90% in developing countries such as India. We also know that in developing countries, more women workers are part of the informal sector than men. Another strategy, therefore, is to help economies transition from an informal economy to a formal economy. This recognizes that people enter the informal economy not by choice, but due to a lack of opportunities in the formal economy and an absence of any other means of livelihood. Recommendation 204, also known as the recommendation concerning the transition from the informal economy to the formal economy, is considered part of this strategy. It provides practical guidance and policies and measures that can facilitate the transition of workers and economic units from the informal to the formal economy while respecting workers' fundamental rights. Promote the creation, preservation and sustainability of enterprises and decent jobs in the formal economy and prevent the informalization of formal economy jobs. It provides guidance on legal and policy frameworks, employment policies, rights and social protections, incentives, compliance and enforcement, freedom of association, collective bargaining and workers' organizations, and data collection and monitoring. In this video, we learned about two broad strategies for improving the conditions of informal work. One focused on improving the conditions in informal work itself because informal work is a growing and significant part of the global economy. The Homework Convention is an important pillar of that strategy. The second focused on creating more opportunities for employment in the formal economy. Both of these strategies require organizations of informal workers, such as their unions, cooperatives and voluntary associations, to play a central role. Grassroots women's organizations must lead action to visibilize the undervalued work of women, particularly in the informal economy. We will learn about this in the next video. Thank you for watching.